Good morning, good morning. It's about time to start the next session. Uh, the first, first session was the overview of Project Olympus. Now we're going to move into a little deeper sections. We covered the server. Mike is not on? Okay, very good. It's powerful. Very good. Um, okay, so I'm uh, proud to uh, let you know that we have a number of wonderful colleagues with me today. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover. We would like to pack every section in 10 minutes. Hopefully, we'll be on time. Uh, I'll, I'll go cover Project Olympus overview just a bit, in five minutes. And then uh, Mark Shaw is going to cover Project Olympus, the Intel-based server. And then we have our colleagues from um, AMD, Cavium, and Qualcomm will go through their respective sections. Wow. What are these things? Okay, as you, re as you saw earlier this morning, Project Olympus is a modular system. It defines a rack, it defines power distribution, defines rack manager, node manager, and defines a number of modules in the form of servers or expansion boxes to go in there. So this is just an overview again. Uh, specifically, uh, we have uh, contributed Project Olympus server, the universal motherboard, it's on GitHub since uh, November. And uh, today, uh, we are proud to announce our collaboration with other server and uh, processor vendors from AMD, Cavium, and Qualcomm. So I'll give the mic to Mark. Mark Shaw is our lead uh, architect. He is going to describe what Project Olympus Universal Motherboard is. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mark A. Shaw. You met Mark E. Shaw earlier. Confusingly enough, I report directly to him. I think he was, I was hired so he'd have someone to blame. <laughs> and you also noticed that uh, everybody else wore green. The memo was to wear blue today. <laughs> All right, so. Um, goals. So we've kind of gone through this quite a bit over the last uh, day. So some of this might be redundant. I'll try to make it uh, at least give a little bit different spin. So the goals of the, this project, Olympus Motherboard, are basically we're optimizing it for our Microsoft partners. That's you know our internal partners, our vendors within Microsoft, Azure's, the Bing's, everything, trying to enable something that they can get to market with very quickly, enable worldwide deployment, optimize it for hyperscale. We're not delivering 10, we're delivering a million of them. The quality, the amount of validation, the less we have to, the less, you know, the more we're able to focus on one thing, the more validation and the more quality we can drive into the data center. I um, mean, we're trying to get this to market as fast as possible. So one of the nice things about this is, hey, as we, do, as we create an infrastructure in which people are innovating, we're not having to drive that innovation as much, less bandwidth on our part, and we're able to absorb technologies into the data center at a much faster rate. Because things move a lot faster than any individual can really keep track of. Um, and we're trying to optimize this for the OCP partners. Now, this is, for me, this has really been the exciting part of this, right, is building relationships with companies within OCP, partnering with them to drive technology, partnering with them to come up with things that benefit all of us. Because at the end of the day, as engineers, we don't want to spend time solving problems that people have already solved. We want to spend our time solving new problems. And uh, a great benefit of OCP is that we get to leverage work of others and get to market faster and spend more time on things that are really cool. Um, we've kind of beaten this slide to death quite a bit, but as we talk about it, in a theme that rolls through Mount Olympus, and I want to get to our system partners, and a theme that rolls through theirs is we want to stay out of the hot aisle, and we want to service in the front, front aisle, and we want to put together an infrastructure that enables technology going forward. So as we created this motherboard, we wanted as much front I.O. as we could possibly get, and we wanted it in standard form factors so that two years down the road when this motherboard is, is, is trying to stay alive and technology is pouring onto this motherboard, we're able to absorb it. 
you know, we went through past histories of, of being in a, a non-standard form factor, and when new technology came along, we're spending months and months and months trying to crowbar that technology into the, into the platform. We want a platform that lives, breathes, and provides value and absorbs technology for, you know, for many years to come through the lifetime of, of the processors that are coming forward and, and the, and the uh, entire platform. So you see lots of front I.O. You see in the rear, you see blind mating PD, PMD, uh, PMDU. We don't want to be back there handling cables. We don't want to even really be back there changing out fans. You know, we have adiabatic data centers, and I, I don't personally have to go into them and service them, but I have talked to people who do, and when I put something out there that puts them in the hot aisle, they immediately, you know, put me to the floor and hold me down and slap me. <laughs> they don't want to be back there, and especially in those adiabatic data centers, it's really hot. So stay out of the rear, service it in the front, enable technologies going forward is kind of the main tenet of, of what this platform is about and where we're going. When we look at just the motherboard itself, some of the things that, uh, that our partners really care about, they want emergency power reduction. We do that at the rack level. Badradin talked about power throttling at the rack level, detecting the power of the rack, and, and basically throttling at, at, at certain key set points, that enables us to load more of these into the rack and not have to worry about over, basically enable us to provision more into the rack and be a little bit closer to the rack's power limits so that we can get as much out of the power subsystems as we can. And then internally on the board, there's going to be overcurrent protection um, so that we can protect the data and everything so that this system can go down gracefully in, in the event of a, something catastrophic. Our management is gigabit ethernet, it's front paneled through the front panel. Basically, this enables system partners and, and if, you know, basically everybody wants to put management at the front. They want to cable gigabit ethernet at the front. We're standardizing on that, so it basically allows us to absorb other technologies into our data center um, as long as we're cable, because the rear cabling is more of a niche to us. Front cabling is much more of a, a pervasive technology. We can do 12 fans, three zones. Um, basically enables Mount Olympus to scale to one U, from 1U to 2U to, to higher level U's if you have, you know, stacked JBODs, things like that. And uh, we're a big believer in I squared C telemetry monitoring. So we are looking at, we're reading temperatures from all PCIe slots, we're reading them from all hot swap controllers, we're reading from all power supplies. So basically all of that telemetry gets gathered, it gets forwarded to the rack manager and anybody, you, service personnel can log in and get all of that telemetry data for a system. And then um, anything that's pre reprogrammable in the, in the, in the uh, system needs to be remotely reprogrammable. So that includes our, any PLDs, FPGAs, all of this can be done through the BMC. The DMC has a JTAG controller on it and we can basically reprogram any JTAG device on the board. On the board. And then of course any, any flash memory is also reprogrammable. And again, beating us to death, we are optimized for cold aisle service. We don't want to be in the hot aisle. OCP support. So just kind of a couple of things that we've partnered with in OCP. This is, Mark, talked, Mark E. talked earlier about a Nick Mez carrier. Basically, this is a PCIe board, plugs into our PCIe slots, and enables the standard OCP Nick mezzanine. This is what gets a OCP customer NCSI sideband Ethernet for their management. And then we collaborated last year with, uh, with partners in Facebook. I'm just going to say Facebook because Facebook can't us, but we partnered with them to create an M.2 carrier board called AVA. It's quad M.2s and enables four terabyte to eight terabytes expansion in a PCIe slot. Um, at the time, this was a small thing. Hey, this is really neat. It's really proving to be something that enables our, uh, our storage and storage expansion in this box going forward. And uh, we're really, really, I'm very pleased with the level of adoption this is getting within, within Microsoft. Out on GitHub, oh, one too many. There we go. Um, out on GitHub, again, we have all the mechanical CAD. We have the schematics and board files for, these, for the Mount Olympus, and we have the specifications. And I invite you guys to go out and peruse that. Do you want to introduce our next person? Yes. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, next, uh, next we have a presentation by uh, AMD, Bob Ogri, please. I'm an old person, that's right. Uh, <laughs>
Can anybody hear me without this mic? I got a lot of noise. Use the mic. Keep the mic. Oh, I'm going to be really loud now. Leave the control. Test. Test. Okay. Uh, good morning. Oh, we got a full room. Um, you don't need to know about me. Uh, I, I've been doing this. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. Um, no, nah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and I say um a lot, so as I can't help it. Uh, one thing I, I I'm probably the longest standing member on the OCPIC meeting, and I don't mean by age. I mean by duration. Um, uh, I've been working with OCP since the beginning. Um, it's been evolving, and I think what we're going to be talking about and what Microsoft's talked about it with Olympus is clear that it is evolving. Um, one of the things that I really liked about the definition of this program, I think Mark and I went back and checked my emails back in April of 2015 is when we first started talking about this, this design, and, and Mark and I talked a lot about how do we get better at opening up the infrastructure um, to allow, as you'll see, other players to, to level the playing field uh, for different CPU architectures. I think that's a first for OCP because, <clears throat> excuse me, I sit on the IC and I see stuff coming that's already done. And I think to spur innovation, this is the right approach. Let people talk about it, let people think about it, collaborate together. And what you're about to see from not only AMD, uh, but from, from the, the next speakers up is that. They're, they're easily uh, able to contribute to that. So one thing I remember, I, I, I tell stories. So I remember the first time in Palo Alto when um, Frank Frankowski asked me to get up on stage and talk. He goes, Bob, give me four bullets where you think we can improve upon this. And I remember I went back and looked at my really drabby, they were really plain slides, and it was common power components, common coolant components, common system management components. And, and system management's always tricky, right? But if you see what Microsoft's done with Olympus, it's based on standard IPMI. It's, I knew a lot of people are gonna say, how come you're not supporting OpenBMC? How come you're I think OpenBMC needs to evolve a little bit, and I think the stack needs to be trimmed down quite a bit. That's my humble opinion, because I've been doing this stuff for a long time. Um, but it, what's really cool, again, you can put multiple GPU architectures in here, and that's me speaking from open compute. I think that's a really good thing for the industry. Um, it's all power efficient. There's three tenants of OCP, power efficiency, modularity, and openness. And I think Microsoft's achieved all three of those goals with this system. And as, as Mark Shaw, you Mark Shaw, uh, talked about earlier, um, you know, that's, that's part of the, of the, the nature of this platform. Um, we will, what I'm about to show you, and it's out on the show floor, um, we're gonna, uh, probably myself, we'll write a base specification for this platform. Uh, that platform, the partner that's working on it that is yet to be disclosed, um, will contribute to that, and we're working together on that to do a full disclosure on the platform in a timely fashion. And again, we have one in our booth, and we have one of these systems in our booth, and we have one of the systems in the Microsoft booth. And they do run, by the way, but uh, they're pretty loud because some of the firmware is not done. Oops. So this is the platform we have in, in the booth. Um, I think pictures are better than the next block diagram they're going to show. And one thing, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this architecture that I've been involved with for probably the last four years. What we've tried to do with Naples is simplify the infrastructure. And if you look at the design, the way I describe it, processor memory I.O. There's no south bridge, there's no switches. Um, it's a very clean and elegant design. You know, two sockets up to 32 cores, uh, an unprecedented amount of, of, of DRAM capability and bandwidth in this design. And, and the key tenant there, and I think throughout some of the talks I've heard uh, about the Naples system, the key here is you need a large memory capacity with commodity DIMMs at the right price. Uh, DRAM is probably the most expensive component in any s server platform. So we've done is we've added eight channels of memory. That way you can use commodity-based DIMMs. 
Uh, what also is really cool about this design, um, and it's gone through an iteration, this is the first version, but um, there's a lot of I.O. in this machine. And from the block diagram, you can tell it's got a total, actually, it was, I was wrong, it's 116 total lanes out of 128. Um, so if you don't know how our architecture works, each processor uh, has a capability by one processor, 120 lanes of PCI Express. And I'm a pointer. When you, when you connect two processors together, we take 64 of those lanes and turn them into what we're calling now is the infinity fabric. I just started to learn that. We call it XGMI, um, Global Memory Interface. Um, but basically, it's hypertransport on steroids. And then each processor still has 64 lanes of PCI Express available. So the electrical is the same. The protocol is different. That bus can be either PCI Express. It can be um, Infinity Fabric. It can be 10 gig KR, um, and it could, it could be SATA as well. So we have a multi-mode protocol phi over the same electricals over PCI Express Gen 3. Uh, so like I said, we have a, a tremendous amount of PCI Express. There's some disclaimers down there from our legal guys, because we're not done with full certs on this yet, so I had to put that in there. Um, but there's a total of 112 lanes, which is really powerful for a 1U box. Um, there's a lot of excitement over this stuff, and I'll, I'll put my hat on sideways, a marketing guy now. A uh, single socket uh, ser server uh, based on Naples makes a really powerful high performance storage box where you don't need switches, you don't need to burn the power, you don't need to absorb the cost. Um, if you look around, moving forward, you're gonna see a lot of excitement around high performance storage boxes where you don't need the switches. Um, it's pretty vanilla. There's not a lot of things on there. Again, I said it's, it's basically power clock, power control, system management. It's a very glueless design. Um, how am I doing on time? Hey, I did it right. All right, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, just, just for you to know, at the end of this all four talks, we will have Q&A, so if you don't mind. Uh, I just want to thank Bob. Bob has been a great uh, colleague. Uh, besides, as part of AMD contributions, Bob himself, as an uh, individual contributor to OCP, has, does a does tremendous job. Uh, he reviews a lot of specs that you guys uh, make contributions. He's part of the incubation community. So uh, he's an advisor to me. I'm, I'm the co-chair for several projects, but uh, incubation committee uh, has uh, Bob uh, making sure that I do a good job. Thank you very much. Maybe you do a great job. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, next, please uh, welcome uh, Gopal Hegde from uh, Cavium. He's going to cover the contribution from Cavium. Let me get the up and down right here. Can you hear me in the back over there? Yes, very good. Thank you. So first of all, CMAC and Microsoft team, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to uh, present uh, our platform here. So the Microsoft team has talked a lot about Project Olympus and its benefits and uh, what are some of the great things about this platform. So I'm not gonna go into uh, what Project Olympus is. However, from the platform standpoint, one of the things that struck us is that the forward thinkingness in terms of the universal motherboard design. It is actually designed to take into account and enable capabilities that are not necessarily available in all the server platforms out there. Uh, and it's a very flexible architecture, doesn't uh, tie uh, motherboard, chassis, power supply, like some of the other designs that we have worked on. And that makes it much easier for us to provide a very flexible platform for a wide variety of workloads, depending on whether you have more storage, more compute, okay, more networking capabilities, whatever you need, you can actually fit it into a standard form factor uh, and into a standard rack and, uh, and have a different motherboard with a different set of capabilities. We worked on this platform uh, with Inventec, which is one of the leading ODMs and is a strong partner for uh, uh, Microsoft for their data center. And uh, this platform is on display at our booth as well as at uh, Microsoft booth, and we're actually showing off 
the Windows uh, Server uh, running uh, search workload on this platform. Along with hardware design, while hardware design was interesting, the other major challenge was also to get the software up and running, right? So Windows Server, as you know, has been, has not uh, until today, okay, was mostly on x86 servers, and getting Windows Server up and running on uh, this platform, okay, and this is a dual socket platform was a major uh, accomplishment, and uh, Microsoft helped us a lot engineers from our side and their side worked together for a long time in order to make this happen. And one of the other things that is happening is, as Leander called out in his presentation, the engagement is not just about the current chip and the current platform and the current product. It's also about what kind of capabilities they would like to see in our future products, in the next generation platforms for and, and, and processors for the data center needs. And this is a very, very big deal because Microsoft operates uh, the one, uh, one of the largest data centers in the world, and they have a tremendous amount of experience in actually deploying, managing these platforms, and the knowledge gained is invaluable to silicon suppliers like us. So we are actually showing off the results of our work. This is early work uh, and uh, workloads running on real live platform in our booth. Sorry, I need to get this one right here. Okay, so talk a little bit about our chip and the value proposition of the chip. We have been working uh, in, uh, you know, we've been working on the ARM server development uh, since 2012. Okay, so we've been doing this for a very, very long time. So this is the first, uh, the Thunder X2, which is our second generation product. Our first generation product is in production and in customer deployment since, uh, uh, 2016, right? So this is our second generation product. So as Leander pointed out yesterday in the talk, the second generation, the first generation product, while interesting and it met the need of some of the scale out applications, etc., the single thread performance was uh, something that the second generation product delivers. So both at a core level as well as at a socket level, we have very competitive performance for some of the hyperscale data centers, and it's very competitive with the high-end x86 servers. And this is what Microsoft uh, was interested in when they started talking to us about our roadmap and about our product. Uh, this actually was something they said, hey, this, is, this looks interesting, so let's work together to bring a platform uh, to, uh, to enable some of our next generation data center workloads. We have been doing dual socket processors now for almost five years. Thunder X was world's first dual socket ARM server processor, and uh, Thunder X2 follows the suite. We have actually upped significantly the coherent bandwidth between the two sockets to match some of the single core and socket level performance enhancements we are delivering with Thunder X2. The platform uh, which you see in uh, our booth as well as in Microsoft booth actually has uh, um, eight memory channels per socket, so a total of, and we support one DPC and two DPC configurations. So not only do we have top of the line memory bandwidth, we also have top of the line memory capacity. And the platform actually has very rich IO in order to support a variety of uh, adapters, interconnects, et cetera, which are required for data center workloads. So finally, what does this mean? What does Microsoft endorsement mean for ARM ecosystem? ARM servers have been around uh, now for past several years. Cavium has been working in this space for past five years. What is great about this announcement is that the vote of confidence from one of the largest data center operators, one of the largest cloud service providers in the world means a lot to the ARM ecosystem. ARM ecosystem has come a long way. However, a major uh, a cloud provider talking about the capabilities and the benefits of uh, the latest generation processors actually opens the door for a lot of our ecosystem partners. We've been working in the ecosystem now for five years and a number of operating systems, the hypervisors, the applications, the BIOS and BMC, all these have been enabled on these platforms. However, the momentum needs to continue 
uh, as you know, server space has a very wide variety of software and, uh, and uh, other capabilities that are required to bring a full solution to the market. Adapters are required, various uh, applications need to be enabled, et cetera. And having endorsement of Microsoft actually gives us a boost in terms of enabling that kind of an ecosystem. Also, a vote of confidence also means that, hey, you know, if it is good enough for Microsoft, it should be good for us as well. So, deployments at other hyperscalers and other uh, tier two data centers is, uh, we expect that to accelerate, okay, due to uh, this uh, announcement here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Our next speaker, Chris Bergen from Qualcomm, please. Thanks, Shamak. So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and tell you a bit about our contribution that we've made uh, from Qualcomm to the open compute community, um, in particular in the context of Project Olympus. Uh, so you've, whoop, oh, it goes down, all right. There we go. All right, okay, first of all, myself, Chris Bergen, um, been working with ARM64, server processors since the inception, enough about me. Um, okay, so you've heard quite a bit over this morning and yesterday about uh, what Microsoft has set out with Project Olympus to do, some of the high-level goals. Um, I believe they've achieved those goals. They set up an infrastructure, a, a rack infrastructure, that addresses, where did I just hit? <laughs> ah, thank you. That addresses many of the needs today consolidating and standardizing on a lot of the rack level requirements, the power distribution, power supply requirements, uh, rack management, all of those things that you really want to have standardized within a data center. But they also left a really large sandbox for us to play within, those of us providing different server solutions, so that we could have flexibility to innovate and provide different solutions to, to the market and contribute them within uh, Project Olympus. So, first of all, I, I'm going to say, I was going to spend a little bit of time talking about how big of a deal it is, the announcement that we heard yesterday morning about Windows Server running on ARM platforms. But, uh, Gopal, you did such a great job. I, I won't say you stole my thunder, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it was really good. I appreciate it. Because it is a big deal. You think about where we are in uh, the evolution of servers today. Uh, Windows Server running on an ARM platform. I know since I've been involved in this, I've been just waiting to hear those words. And uh, this is a big deal. We're going to look back on this and we're going to say, yeah, I was there when I heard it happen. Um, but this, it has been a lot of work and it's been a, a collaborative effort. Certainly, we've spent a lot of time uh, worth, with our uh, colleagues over at Microsoft uh, making all the pieces come together, both on the software side and the hardware side. Um, really greatly appreciate all the time that's been put in uh, from the folks of uh, Mark Shamak and all the other guys over at Microsoft to help uh, bring this to a reality. Um, also, before I, I move on, I do want to uh, shout out a little bit to a couple of folks in our team, uh, Mr. John Lawfink and Praveen Hurry. These are some of the guys, the uh, platform architecture guys, who are really the, 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 the brainchilds behind uh, bringing, making this happen. There's a lot of really cool stuff that went into this design making it flexible, modular, um, that really is, is a great, great work from these guys. So first of all, you can see this platform running over in the Microsoft booth, running Windows Server, and I do encourage you to stop by and see that because it is, it, I mean, it's, it's a very subtle, low-key demo, but it speaks volumes to where we've gotten to today. Um, and this is running on our uh, Centric 2400, Qualcomm Centric 2400, um, we announced this back in December, uh, and we, we mentioned at that time, you know, it's a 48 core, but more importantly than anything else, this is the world's first 10 nanometer processor, right? This is a, a big deal, okay? So we got a big deal on top of a big deal here. World's first 10, first 10 nanometer processor is an ARM processor, and it's a Qualcomm processor. It's got 48 cores in it. This provides a, a platform, a basis, 
for the cloud workloads of today and moving forward. So I think Linda touched on a couple of these things, you know, search, you know, on the indexing side, on the, on the results generation side, but it goes beyond that as well. We're talking, yes, next generation storage needs, um, any of the high throughput computing, and big data analytics, Hadoop, et cetera. And when we designed this system, we designed with those workloads in mind as well. So there's a flexibility and modularity around this. I'll get into a little bit more in a moment. But first of all, the one that you're seeing here is, this is our single node. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of the details uh, of, the, of the board in, in a moment. But this is the single node. The, the contribution that we're making is this motherboard, a single node mother, motherboard that's a nice compact form factor and fits well into this, uh, into this uh, Project Olympus uh, chassis definition. Um, and again, optimized for compute throughput, uh, uh, as well as high memory uh, requirements, applications, et cetera. So let me talk a little bit about the board. I'm gonna, again, I, I think you guys probably have seen this a couple of times already, but nonetheless, again, just to, to show it in person, you guys are more than welcome to come by and take a closer picture of it uh, later if you like, or stop by the uh, Microsoft booth and see it. Um, so as you can see here, uh, single, single socket design, bringing out uh, two DIMMs per channel of uh, six uh, DDR4 memory channels. Again, DDR4 to give us a leading edge performance on memory, memory bandwidth. Um, plenty, of, uh, plenty of memory bandwidth to keep those cores fed too. It's a, it's a very nice, nice balanced design um, around uh, the, the memory and the cores. Um, again, running up to 2667, uh, so high, high end of the uh, DDR speed today. Uh, it, so in the context of Project Olympus, there's a 50 gigabit NIC in there. Um, the PCIe connectivity, I think I'd like to talk about a little bit more. So certainly, uh, again, there's a lot, a lot of flexibility of what you can do with this. I know you've heard about Microsoft Smart NIC. They've mentioned that before. Uh, capability to, to use that or FPGAs, uh, uh, you know, standard NICs, other, other uh, devices as well. But one of the really cool things that these guys came up with was the use of these riser cards. If you can see, right, in each of these PCIe slots, these are by 16 slots coming out. With the use of these riser cards, it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in how you bring out those PCIe's. The SOC itself uh, supports multiple root controllers underneath those uh, PCIe lanes. And with the riser cards, we're able to do things like uh, one riser card that brings out a couple of M.2s and leaves another by 8 to be able to cable over some, to another, another point in the system. Um, you can, well, I'll get to the Mellanox in a moment, but. Uh, let's see, also, of course, bringing out the USB connectors, uh, Ethernet Phi, eight SATA ports. If you, here we go here. If we look back on this uh, diagram here, you see those eight drives. Those are all natively connected directly to the SSC. All right, let's see. So the requisite block diagram. Um, and again, this is in the uh, contribution, so uh, you'll be able to, to see this block diagram a little bit more clearly uh, when we get a chance to get that to you. But, so as you can see, of course, bringing out to the front panel the, 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 the usual things that you would want, right? Your UART connectivity to the uh, SOC, uh, your uh, BMC connect connectivity to Ethernet. Um, you know, actually, there's an Ethernet debug port directly into the SOC itself. And again, one of the things that you don't see is a Southbridge, right? It is a true SOC, all of that integrated. Uh, the one thing that we do, of course, leave outside is the BMC. This, this guy has the uh, AST2520 uh, running on the board there. And of course, all of the other usual stuff you expect, your I2C and spies and all that good stuff to, to connect up to that. Okay. Uh, so this is, again, one of the key things, really in the full spirit of Project Olympus. Again, what they allowed for is the ability to not just develop something in the context of Project Olympus, but to be able to take that same design and use it in other areas. And that's exactly what we did here with our reference platform, the REP, Reference Evaluation Platform. This guy, um, so this is shipping out to customers already. Um, you know, it's available. Some, some are using these standalone, some of them at a rack level. This is actually really, truly out there today, the, 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 the Qualcomm Century 2400, really live running running workloads, running in evaluation platforms. Um, so this guy here, what we did was, um, you see this conf configuration here with the two nodes side by side. And again, this is, again, part of the whole modularity concept here. By pulling out a couple of those hard drives, 
We're able to put in the second node there um, using Mellanox technology, their multi-host NIC and an Oculink cable. We're able to connect these two hosts up to a single NIC so you're saving your top of rack ports. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, with this, you've got to combine 64 lanes of PCIe Gen 3 coming out of all of this and allowing you for, obviously, uh, you know, connectivity to your uh, flash storage drives, et cetera. Um, total of 24 DIMM slots in this. Actually, that is another thing as well. Uh, let's see, I think we got the next slide here. Yes, exactly. So a lot of options here of what you can do with this type of flexibility and, and modularity of design. These are some different concepts that we've cooked up. These are not actual boards yet, but this is more uh, what we're allowing for others, you know, OEMs of the world and such, to, to run with and, and bring to market uh, within the context of Project Olympus or not. Uh, so a couple of different concepts. So for, exa for example, say uh, an NVE farm, right? So non-volatile memory farm, you could run this with a single node, have 20 NVMe SSDs attached to it, and have your PCIe connectivity left over for your NIC and such. Um, potentially an acceleration. Say you have a, a Xilinx FPGA board or so. You can see here this uh, full-length bo board right here. One of the neat things they did with the riser is have a, a, a reversed riser so that you can have the uh, FPGA on the other side there where, that, where the, those uh, SATAs would be. Or a GPU, whatever it may be. Uh, so a lot of different uh, uh, flexible options here. Let's see. And, oh yeah, one last thing. Again, like I mentioned, this is actually going, shipping out uh, sampling today. Um, in order for us to, to be able to do that, of course, it has to be truly a, a, a full system ready, including all of the, the OS support, all of the firmware support. Uh, we've got AMI as a commercial provider for uh, the, the BIOS through the uh, Aptio V, and the BMC uh, solution is uh, through their Megarack. Um, and of course, uh, all of this on the Project Olympus version all ties in quite nicely with the uh, Rack Manager Project Olympus is defined. Let's see. So yeah, all of this is really uh, possible uh, based on two, two things that have come together at this point. One is Microsoft's driving this whole Project Olympus to make sure that we have a, a good, like I said, a sandbox for us to innovate within, bring a solution out that really, really works, but also the, the world's first 10 nanometer server that is the Qualcomm Centric 2400 ARM server that is gonna be uh, truly used in cloud applications. It is, it is there, it's ready, and uh, really feel good to be here to be able to tell you all about it today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, um, I'm also pleased to announce that, I think Chris mentioned it, but I'm restating it. Um, Qualcomm has already submitted the spec uh, for this board in conjunction with Project Olympus. It just went live yesterday. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the speakers again and for a session of question and answers, please. Bob? Questions, please? Hi, uh, just very interesting for the you know uh, AMD platform and also the server based on ARM. I tr I would like to understand about the power envelopes uh, for the AMD platform as well for the ARM uh, processor based server platforms. The CPU power envelope. I'll start. We're we're not yet announcing any power specs, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will eventually, but but not here today. I, I think one comment. I think we've disclosed quite a bit about our new architecture here. Um, maybe more so than others, but that's there's a few things we're going to leave to be for a surprise. <laughs> I, I will comment though that you did not see any fancy uh, uh, heat pipes or anything on our design. <laughs> I have a question um, to Chris. You showed one CPU socket and the other CPU socket. 
What's tying them both? Oh, no, these, these are independent nodes. So they would be, like I said, if you, if you have them both in a single uh, uh, 1U chassis, then, for example, using the multi-host NIC from Mellanox is a good option for bringing that up to, to the top of rack. Uh, but they are independent server nodes. So, so actually, I know that the, the three uh, CPU vendors don't want to talk about power, obviously, including uh, Qualcomm, who I work for. But the question for Mark is, that design you showed with that heat sink, what's the maximum power per socket that you can handle in that board design with, without getting into whose CPU or what CPU? I'm probably going to take the fifth on that also. <laughs> I, 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 offer, I offer a number. We aren't saying numbers, but part of the, the reason for that big monstrous heat sink is to reduce the airflow through the server. So you distribute, the, you distribute it out, you reduce the airflow, and in our data centers, the big, huge cooler fans run significantly lower speed when you use that type of heat sink. So even though you don't need it, you might want to think about something like that. So. So you could probably do 200 or 250 watts with that? <laughs> yes, under different environmental conditions. So the, the, the design of the system is uh, broader than what we needed. So let's just work together. Yeah, let's work together and come up with the requirements, and we'll look to see what, what, what's possible. A uh, question for um, Bob. Um, you indicated for um, Open and BMC, you believe there's so many um, stacks in it that needs to be reduced. But I missed out on the flavor of BMC that you're using to date. Yeah. Uh, was the question, what, what's the flavor of the BMC we're using? Uh, I believe in this design, it can be multiple A-speed solutions. It could be the 2000, 2020, 2500. So again, uh, that's, that's why I made a little comment, and I'm glad you're listening. Uh, it runs a standard AMI firmware stack today. It runs a standard AMI BIOS. There's nothing preventing the, any of these platforms from running uh, OpenBMC and OpenBMC firmware stacks. But my comment is, I think Facebook announced that they did a cleaner implementation on op OpenBMC in their current generation platforms, and bravo to them for doing it. I still think it needs a little bit more wider adoption, meaning all of us up here would have to sit down and go through. There's so many different specifications, right? It's based, this is based, and I think all these platforms are based on standard IPMI 2.0, right? Um, but then, there, then there's Redfish, and... Um, so, so Bob, what I'm hearing through your comment is that you're inviting collaboration. Absolutely. We need everybody to come in with the requirements and with the offer to help. Uh, this is a community effort. Yeah, it is, and I think it's evolving. It needs to evolve, actually, is a better way of putting it. Uh, and I think if I look at, from my perspective, to make things more collaborative, it needs to be simple. Complexity is always an issue. Simplify the stack. Simplify the features. At this, this level of data center deployment, you don't, you don't send out a guy when he sees a light flash and you turn it off, you got another one, you come back in a month, scooter boy comes out, swaps it out, pops another one in. So I think some of the other management standards are aimed at the enterprise. And I talk too much. <laughs> questions over there? Could you uh, talk a little bit about the workloads that are that run exceptionally well on each of your CPUs, and then a workload example that is particularly ill-suited for your workload CPU? Give me the best and the worst case. So, I mean, you must have tested it. Uh, ill-suited. That, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, wouldn't, yeah, our Naples CPU, that's a great, thank you, <laughs> wouldn't make a great Xbox part, right? Uh, work, workloads and, and different architectures, 
and, and I'm not going to boast, but I have, again, I tell a story. You know, AMD was doing an ARM CPU. We, have, we did an ARM CPU. Part of the early struggles was what were those workloads we're trying to go after with, with those parts. And I'm sure you guys know that what Linder was saying yesterday is, is evolving, right? Search, different people have a different view of their own workloads, right? Uh, Microsoft has a view of their Bing workloads and what its dependencies are. Microsoft has a view of their Azure stack and what workloads run. I think my, my only comment is, moving forward in the future, I see workload-specific servers, and I think that's what you're starting to see here evolve today. Um, you know, I don't think our part would be the best cost-effective mail server, but it can work. Maybe these guys' stuff, and, and I'm not, it's evolving, And but I think if you look at CPU architecture and design moving forward, and like we've done, it's become modular. And moving forward in the future, I don't, I don't, is it public? I can't say that. Um, I know too many things, but I think individually those workloads will mature over time, be it x86 or ARM. And I think what you're seeing here is a single socket ARM, a dual socket ARM, a dual socket x86. It's, it's all about workloads and evolving workloads and tuning workloads to both the ARM architecture and the traditional legacy x86 architecture. Right, so, so, so as, as you hear, there's a lot of flexibility on the workload, but as far as the hardware design and partitioning, you have also noticed that we are disaggregating the server node from the expansion box. We do have a talk at uh, one o'clock today, and with an expansion box concept, the server node, the head node can be specific to the workloads and be coupled to an expansion box, as an example. So again, we invite collaboration on the workloads and capabilities and your work to add to the series of servers or series of expansion boxes. No more questions. Seems we did a good job up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I, I thank my colleagues here from several companies, and you see the collaboration actually will produce results. It takes some time, but with a clear delineation of work and clear boundaries of individual modules, if we at a uh, uh, community define clear boundaries, innovations can be done separately and can be combined. So please join the effort, participate in the server project uh, team, uh, call in, make contributions, and we'll make a better world together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I liked it. Thank you. Get some people on the line. Hey, thanks, you guys.